My alarm. It's 5 a.m. and I'm awake. F my life. Birdsong. Why are they up so early? What have they got to do that's so pressing and why do they have to make so much f***ing noise? I reach for my phone to... Wait. There's something about today. There's something I have to do today. Oh no. Today is D-Day. Decentralized day. Which means I can't touch my phone. Mustn't touch my phone. Well, can I touch my phone? I don't even know. Damn birds. Wait. Are birds decentralized? Am I allowed to listen to them? Or is there a central authority that governs birds that can be shut down at any moment? Actually... That might not be such a bad thing. I'm typing this on a... Wait, this computer. Is it decentralized? I'm connected to the internet. Maybe I shouldn't be. Do I know who my ISP is? Birds. So many birds. Why won't they shut up? And where do I even start? If you think too long about decentralization, it can start to overwhelm you. The same way it can if you try to follow a new diet plan or try to live a completely carbon neutral lifestyle. And it's not as simple as just flicking a switch. Decentralization is a sliding scale and there are many nuances to its application. In 2021, the world is a long way from being ready to go fully decentralized, but we can learn a great deal from trying. And that's the purpose of today's film, to see just how feasible it is right now to live a completely decentralized life. So, if the question of how on earth we could possibly live without centralized services is one that keeps you up at night, then you've come to the right place because this is School of Block, demystifying decentralization, one block at a time. One block at a time. And today, it's time for a decentralization detox. Oh yes. Oh yes. Ah. Oh. oh. Oh yeah. Hmm. I'm ready. What did you see, Clary? Ugh, what is that? Ah, no, ah! No, dude, come on! We talked about this. There is this temptation to paint going decentralized as almost living off grid of completely detaching yourself from reality, but that's not really what's going on here. What we're talking about is using services which are not controlled by centralized entities. And it's funny when you think about how much you connect with Facebook, WhatsApp, Spotify, Netflix, all centralized services. And fundamentally, what we're thinking about here is freedom to a degree, financial freedom specifically. But before I could get deep into this journey, I wanted to speak to someone who had really done this for real. And I found a very interesting Dutch man by the name of Didi. We are going to make a change. This is the only moment left that we have to keep control on our lives, on our finances, on everything. Because people will stay sheeple. Even if we convince him for 100%, yeah. Bitcoin. Didi is hugely passionate, no doubt. But as I listen to him talk about his trading groups and financial self-help sessions, all from his base in Tulum, Mexico, with his Bitcoin hat and vest, I couldn't help feel that this was a very long way from being a life normal people could relate to. So I decided to bring things back closer to home. So we're walking around the streets of Amsterdam and it's amazing. People are starting to come out and shop again and it reminds you just how centralized the world has become. Over the last 50 years or so, we've seen high street shops merged into giant supermarkets. And it's happened at things like government level as well. Everything converging on large centralized data centers or geographical locations. And it makes you wonder, is centralization so bad? After all, it's hugely convenient. And on the opposite side of this, if you want to decentralize things, take Brexit for example, it can be extremely expensive, extremely painful, and extremely awkward. And the painful realization for me as I started to research this film was that if I really wanted to go completely decentralized, the honest truth is we just aren't ready for that yet. The original plan for this film was to do a full 24 hours completely decentralized, but we quickly realized that this just wasn't going to be possible, not properly anyway. The services we need don't really exist yet. But what we can do is take a whistle-stop tour through how you might go about it and take a close look at just how much of our lives is controlled by centralized services. 
more than you might think. So let's start with this, a mobile phone, the gateway drug to all the connected entertainment that streams through our daily lives. If you've ever done a digital detox, you'll realize just how embedded these services have become. But going decentralized doesn't mean ditching your phone completely. No. It means saying no to giving your data and your identity to centralized organizations. And it might surprise you to learn that there are in fact already crypto-friendly phones out there like the Samsung S10, which featured a blockchain wallet, or the HTC Exodus, which not only featured a wallet, but allows users to run a full Bitcoin node by storing the full ledger on a 400 gigabyte SD card. Now, one of those will run you about 50 euros these days. But given the chain is growing in size all the time, you're probably gonna need a new card within 18 months or so. There is also a very handsome phone from Sirin Labs called the Finny, which runs on its own Sirin OS, a modified version of Android, and all transactions are powered by its native token, SRN. The phone features its own cold wallet and promises to allow you to use decentralized applications as easily as the centralized versions you're accustomed to. But you can go even further here by building your own Bob. Yeah, you heard me right, Bob. Bob stands for block on block, and its makers are calling it the world's first true blockchain phone, enabling you to take full control of your data and privacy. Sounds good, right? So if you do a search for the Bob phone, you will find this rather kind of exciting looking website, but also there was an Indiegogo page, so they clearly crowdfunded this thing. And if I look at how much it cost, like you could get the early bird special one times Bob for 468 euros, and only six out of 20 were claimed. Yeah, it didn't, doesn't look like it was a particularly successful Indiegogo campaign. And it looks like they raised 23,188 euros, which is not a lot, really. Now, these technology projects, when they go on Indiegogo, they tend to be quite successful. So what's going on here? They've won a CES Innovation Award. Well done. And but anyway, look, if we look at the phone, this thing looks awesome, if I'm honest. I've never seen a phone that looks anything like this. It is... It's wild, it's got weird straps on it, it's got dials, it's white, it's got this kind of future retro thing. And then <laughs> down, lower down it says, use your imagination to build your own Bob. Bob will come in a mod assembly kit which contains the following components, the motherboard display. So it's a modular phone that you can kind of, I guess 3D print your own version of. All of these things look great in 3D renders like white plastic, you just know it's gonna get dirty. These things are gonna break. It, it's like, once you start putting it into kind of daily use, I worry that this thing is gonna be flimsy as hell. But I love the idea of it. I've always loved the idea of being able to customize phones and also just breaking out of this kind of smooth smartphone design that we've always had. I'm, I'm down for that. But like, there is a few things about this phone that don't quite add up. And that's kind of the problem with niche hardware and niche electronics, isn't it? You see, there's a long and very ignominious history of niche hardware electronics failing to gain traction because hardware is hard. The upfront costs alone are usually enough to sink a company before it even gets off the ground. And I highly recommend watching the documentary on general magic to understand why this happens. And this is why nearly all of the blockchain innovation we currently see is purely at the software level. What is what does it sound? Is that coming from your laptop? It's not supposed to sound... What the... What's all that crap? Taking a moment to think while writing this film, I realized just how much of what we do relies on electricity and how much we depend on a reliable supply of juice to power... everything. But can we decentralize energy? Well, as it happens, yes. Now, I live in the Netherlands, and here the government has pledged to quintuple renewable power generation by 2030. And thanks to recent developments in renewable energy technologies such as batteries, heat pumps, and solar panels, it's now possible to produce, convert, and store energy locally. And what's emerging here is a promising new concept in which energy flows can be balanced at the distribution system level in microgrids. 
Now, the European Union is actively looking to help facilitate the creation of local energy communities, bringing citizens together in local energy cooperatives, to the extent that it's estimated almost half of all EU households will be producing renewable energy by 2050, of which more than a third is participating in a local energy community. Now, the most familiar example of this would be installing solar panels, but beyond this, we're starting to see the creation of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platforms powered by blockchain, like this one from Bax & Company. Now, if you live in the town of Aimness, which is about 35 kilometers from Amsterdam, then you can already buy and sell energy peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, it's an early pilot, but it is a sign of where the renewable energy mission is headed, at least in this modestly-sized European country. So when I'm thinking about how I get to work, where my energy comes from, yes, there are options, and it's early, but if you drive a Tesla, you could fuel that Tesla with sustainable, carbon-neutral energy from a decentralized energy network. And yes, you could even have bought that Tesla with Bitcoin. Check this. Facebook generated $86 billion worth of revenue in 2020, up from 71 in 2019 and 56 in 2018. But here's the most startling statistic of all. It was estimated to have won 23.5% of US digital ad revenue over 2020. That's nearly a quarter of it. So that makes you think, can we decentralize the services we use like Facebook, WhatsApp, and YouTube? Can we? Should we? Now, we already know Facebook has been spying on us and selling on our data. And that famous saying, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, has never been truer than now. So for entertainment, there are options. You can turn to theater or DLive for live streams or library, which is a decentralized version of YouTube. There are also alternatives to Twitter and Facebook like Diaspora and BitCloud. Or you can support musicians with fairer streaming models through a platform like Audius. The godfather of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, is also building a new platform called Solid that allows users to ring-fence their data and the access to that data in what he calls pods. Now, there's one big problem with all of these platforms, and that is... We have grown so accustomed to just having whatever we want, whenever we want, that the motivation to move to a different platform even in the face of overwhelming evidence that the organizations running the apps we use are absolutely 100% not our friends, we still don't want to change. And that brings us back to the age-old question facing any technology startup. Does it scale? The truth is, these legacy platforms just aren't ready to be shot down yet. But there is one that is, and it's happening faster and faster. Yes, money. We are on our way to see if we can hunt down a Bitcoin ATM because you see, the, one of the most fundamental use cases for blockchain and probably one of the most important was for payments. And if you want people to use Bitcoin like they use money, then they need to be able to take it out of the bank like they use money. The funny thing about COVID is that we've stopped using cash. Like cash is pretty much on its way out. So do we even need an ATM? But it is interesting because we're witnessing the birth of what is essentially a decentralized financial ecosystem that allows anybody anywhere to interact with money. And these Bitcoin ATMs may not be needed anymore. But let's see if we can find it. According to the map, this is where there's supposed to be a Bitcoin ATM. And if we look at the map, it actually says that that over there is the largest skate park in the Netherlands. I do love a good skate park. There's a lot of kids doing a lot of very cool things over there. I wonder if they know about Bitcoin. I wonder if they even give a crap about Bitcoin. But the only thing I can think of is it must be in that shop over there. But like, there's literally no chance that there's a Bitcoin ATM anywhere near here. It would surprise me, but let's go and take a look and see if we can find it. Hey, uh, looking for a Bitcoin ATM? No? No. Well, Kel surprise, there's no Bitcoin ATM here. It must have gone. Um, our information was wrong. I'll well, just prove the point though, like, why do we even need them in this world where there's no cash? A phrase you might hear when learning about blockchain is, be your own bank, and that means self-custodying your assets. Instead of giving your money to a bank to keep safe, that obligation is all your own, which means you're in control, but that also means you are also entirely responsible for what happens to your private keys, how to store your passwords, and how you manage your assets. If something goes wrong, there's no customer service helpline on the Ethereum blockchain to help you out. Hello, yeah, I've got a problem. 
So, it's vitally important to create a fail-safe mechanism for yourself, whether by storing private keys in a vault, using VPNs, storing assets on hardware wallets, or even in the soft tissue between your ears with a brain wallet. But we'll cover that in more detail in a future video because it's one piece of this puzzle that you definitely do not want to get wrong. So I set out to make a really fun film here, but we ended on a sobering note. AWS controls so much of the internet that unpicking ourselves from that relationship is going to be harder than we think. But there is hope, of course. The way decentralized finance is starting to emerge gives me hope, at least, that Web3, in all its glory and power, could be the way forward. And we'll be covering Web3 in the very next episode. And beyond that, we go into NFTs and the way they unlock new entrepreneurial opportunities for creators and many more besides. So there are things to look forward to. So if this episode has left you with a ton of burning questions, don't panic because that's what we do here. We are School of Block, demystifying decentralization one block at a time. And of course, we are better than animals. We do deserve better. So here is to your financial freedom.